Daniel Priestley, hey. ladies and gentlemen. Hey, welcome. Thank you very much for having me at the conference. Good to see you. How is everyone? Fantastic to see you. So looking at the website for Expert Empire, it said that a big part, in fact, reason number one to come along to this conference was to get clients, to get more customers. Who likes the idea of getting more customers, right? Lots of, yeah. So we're going to talk a lot about getting more customers. Today is a little bit of a special day for me as well. It's a bit of a book launch day. You've got my new book in front of you. Let me give you a little bit of background though before we cover the content. So my background is that I've been an entrepreneur now for 20 years this month. So 20 years ago when I was 21 years old, I launched my very first company in Australia. And before I did that, I worked for this guy here called John. And I was 19 years old. I rocked up to John's house and said that I wanted to drop out of university and could I join his startup. And he said, sure, I don't know what job you're going to do. We don't have a business name and we don't have a bank account yet, but we're going to start a business. And I was one of the very first people sitting around that table, there were three of us, and we launched this new business. And I was John's kind of assistant, his, I guess you could call Swiss army knife. I could do 25 things badly. And, and John got me to do all sorts of things. And, uh, and I learned so much. It was like this apprenticeship that you couldn't dream of as a 19 year old, where I learned a lot about advertising and marketing and sales and logistics and hiring and firing and all of that sort of stuff. Over the following two years, we built the business from an idea to about six million of revenue per year in year two. So it was a very fast growth business. We went from sitting around the kitchen table to having an inner city office in Melbourne with about 60 employees. So you can imagine what an incredible experience that was to go through that fast growth. When I got to age 21, I went to John and I said, hey John, I was there right at the beginning and I've helped you from every single step of the way and now we're a multi-million dollar company would I be able to get some shares in the company? What do you think he said? <laughs> he said, Dan, if you want shares in a company, you've got to go start your own company. <laughs> so it was like, ooh, okay, fair enough. But it was cruel to be kind because he'd given me the apprenticeship and I went off and I started my own company. And that business went and became a $10 million company within three years. So it was a very fast growth company. By the time I was, oh, hey. <laughs> So by the time I was 25, we had about a million dollars a month going through the business, which was pretty amazing. But I'll tell you, the first lesson I got from John was this one. He said, everything is downstream from lead generation. If you can't generate leads, then it doesn't matter how good the product is, it doesn't matter how good your salespeople are, none of that matters because everything's downstream from lead generation. You've got to fix that problem. You've got to have lots and lots of leads. Look at the people who are typically up on the stage at a conference. They've got a very sophisticated, successful lead generation approach. They generate lots and lots of leads. They have an abundance of leads. Most of the time they have so many leads they can't keep up with them. They have waiting lists because they have so many leads. So the lead generation problem is that first problem. When I first started, this is me at age 21. This is me running my very first ad in the newspaper. Right. So this is my very first lead generation approach. I stick an ad in the newspaper, it had a 1-800 number, free call to call up. Uh, it looks like I'm happy in that photo. In actual fact, I'm terrified because I've put $8,000 on my credit card and I have no way of paying that $8,000 off if that ad doesn't perform. If that ad didn't work, I had no ability to pay off the cost of running the ad. Luckily, the phones rang, 100 leads came in. We responded, we spoke to people and we made about $35,000 worth of sales, which was really cool. And uh, we rerun that ad in the newspaper 40 times that year, so 43 times. So basically, we just run it and again and again. And basically, I would run the ad, make sales, pay off the credit card, run the ad, make sales, pay off the credit card, and we just 43 times that year. So that was age 21. Eventually, the business grew. We grew a global business. We ran big events all over the world. Now, next big lead generation approach was joint ventures and partnerships to put on big conferences all over the world. I arrived in London in 2006. In 2007, we ran a 2,000 person event at the London Palladium Theatre in the West End, and that was a great lead generation approach. And along the way, we did lead generation through email marketing, and that was an incredible approach that we did. Then the next thing I got into was writing books. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to write some books? Lots of people would come in if they read the books. So I wrote four books about entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial journey. And they're all really good lead generation approaches, except for one thing. All of those lead generation approaches are what's called broadcast only. I get to 
set, put our message out into the marketplace, but I don't know much about the people reading the books. I don't know much about the people attending the events. Much like today, I don't know if this gentleman is the CEO of a NASDAQ-listed company or a fish and chip shop down the road. I have no idea. So it's broadcast only. It's a one-way communication. And then that changed. So when I did the revised edition of Key Person of Influence, I was about to put it out into the marketplace and I had this weird thought, maybe we should have a way of people telling us about themselves and that we could learn more about them. So in the book is the five P's of becoming a key person of influence. And I said, you know what, we'll do an assessment where people answer 40 questions and we tell them whether they're any good at those five P's. We'll actually, based on how they answer, we'll give them a score against the five P's. So in the book, we put in this new page and it said, go to the website and take the online scorecard to see whether you've got the ability to influence. And when people would type in the URL, up comes this website that we built. And it says, discover your influence score, increase your ability to influence. They put in their name, their email and location. And then they answer a series of questions. So 40 questions pop up one at a time, typically yes or no questions and really simple questions to ask. So have you written a blog or an article in the last month? And if somebody Googled your name, would they find mostly page one is good links featuring you? So lots of little questions. And then it comes up with a nice kind of display as to how you did and where you're strong and where you're weak. And you get this nice little report. Based on how you score, you'll see a different video. And the video will invite you to come along to an event or to talk to our team. You then use Calendly to book in and talk to the team. And when my sales team pick up the phone to talk to you, they get all of the data. So they can actually see how you responded to all of the questions. And they basically can have a really great conversation because they can cherry pick which topics they want to talk to you about based on how you answered. So the sales call is really cool. Rather than having to start the call with the worst possible sentence ever, tell me a little bit about yourself. Who's been on the receiving end of that? Where, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. I'll tell you about myself, I'm busy. That's what I'll tell you about myself. So instead of tell me a bit about yourself, what about this as a sales call? Hi, Chris, you took our key person of influence scorecard yesterday. Your high score was for partnerships. You scored 87%. Your lowest was for pitching, 26%. I was wondering, would you like to improve that low score? Would you like to improve your pitching skills? Because that's what your scorecard told us was the area that needs the most improvement. That is a really powerful conversation because nobody says, no, you know what, my pitching sucks and I want to leave it that way. So what you end up with is something that is both automated and also very personalized. Now, normally those two things don't happen. Normally, personalization is when it's human and you don't have much automation involved or automation is one size fits all and it just churns it all out. So the, a bit of a holy grail is if you can do personalization and automation in the one. Quick question before we get into how to do this is how many leads per week for your business would be life-changing? And when I say life-changing, literally you'd be living a very different life. Like as in, I want you to stop and think about it. If you had, let's say, 100 leads a week and every single week they just kept coming in, people saying, I'd love to work with you, I'd love to work with your business, can I get more information please, can you send me through a brochure? If you had 100 a week, would that be life-changing? Different house, different car, different holidays? Would it be, who here, the number is like between 10 and 100 per week, right? Wow, most of you, right? 10 to 100 leads per week and that's it, life change. Who here, it's higher, it's like more like 500 leads a week or something like that. Wow, no one's even high. Okay, great. We can change all of your lives with 10 to 100 leads per week. That's pretty cool. So let me tell you, for us, when we launched this, 90,000 leads came in. All of them were data-rich leads. We generated 15 million pounds worth of sales. The strategy hardly changed since we launched it in 2015. It always continued to grow year on year. It's simple and hardly anyone's doing it, right? It's so rare that you see these assessments out there. You get Everyone's got a podcast, everyone's got videos. They're, those are great things, by the way. A lot of people have got a book, but not very many people have got an assessment. It, it takes about one to two hours to set this up, right? So it takes less time than recording and editing a video or less time than doing a podcast episode. And it's insanely cheap to run. Once it's up and running, it just runs and runs and the leads come in and it's, it's really cheap. So when people saw this happening, 
a lot of my clients said, hey, can I get a scorecard too? So in 2019, we built about half a dozen scorecards from scratch using WordPress, and we charged about eight to 10,000 pounds to do all the writing of it and the design and literally having to build it and code it from scratch. And then in 2020, we said, you know what, we're going to build this into a platform, make it super cheap, and we launched ScoreApp. And ScoreApp has been just so cool. Over 2,500 people are now using ScoreApp since we launched it. Is anyone using ScoreApp in the room? Yay, very cool. Well done. Someone yesterday did their brand test from stage, and a third of you took their online assessment. They did a QR code, and you all went and did the assessment. That was sitting on ScoreApp. So ScoreApp is a way of generating high converting leads. Lots of people are now using it. Some big name people are using it. And today is actually day one of our new ScoreApp book called Scorecard Marketing. Can I be really cheesy? Can I get a selfie with all of you holding up the book? Would that be like, would that be too much to ask? And every, everyone's got to have it up. Okay. I love you guys. The best. All right, I'm done now. That's all I wanted. Okay, so score up, it's all templated. It's really super simple. You just basically pick a template. It's already pretty much done for you and you just edit the text. And it's like literally you just make it go live and you start getting data, you start getting leads and it all just works. So it's really nice. It's like when you first switch on like Instagram or something and you go, oh, this is pretty easy. I just put some photos in and do my profile and then it all just works from there. Some cool people you might have heard of are using scorecard marketing with us, like Jay Shetty, but some people you may not have heard of, like some coaches and some speakers who don't have the same profile as Jay, saying that it's been game-changing. Their first month was hundreds of leads. Within 10 days, it became the number one source of leads. All right, so let's get into why it works first. So people love taking scorecards. They love doing this stuff, and here's why. The first one, is the reason people buy anything is to resolve tension. So we feel a sense of tension between the current situation and the desired situation that we want, and that's why we buy stuff. It could be something small. If I said to you, sorry to be rude, but your breath smells like tacos, you're, <laughs> that, create, right? that creates tension, and you're thinking, I need to go get myself a packet of chewing gum, right? I'm going to duck out in the break. It doesn't. That was just made up. But, People buy to resolve tension, so we experience tension. Your customers, anyone who's ever bought from you, has done so because they wanted to resolve some tension. And it's always the situation of where they are now versus where they want to be, right? Think about it like this. People don't buy airline seats, they buy the destination that they want to get to, and there's the tension between where they are right now and where they would like to go on holiday, and there's the tension, and the greater the tension, the more likely they are to buy. My first question for you on this is, what is the outcome that your clients want? What do you think that they would love to achieve? Have a quick think about that and write that down. What is the desired outcome? What's the finishing line or what's the end result, the end state that your customers want to get to? Because if you can be really clear at outlining and articulating this is the end result, then that immediately creates tension because if people, unless they've got that end result, they're going to feel a sense of tension of, oh, I'm here, but I want that thing that's there. So I've got a, a feeling of tension between the two. So you think about tension. The greater the tension, the more desire people have to buy from you. So we need something that highlights the tension. And the beauty of a scorecard is it highlights the tension and it quantifies it in numbers. So when people took the key person of influence scorecard, the desired outcome is to become a key person of influence in the industry. That's what the people want. And then they could quantify it and they'd say, oh, currently I'm a 23% in that goal. I've got 77% to go, right? I've got a, a ways to go. So by answering those questions, each question that they say no to creates a little bit of tension. And then the big reveal at the end creates a lot of tension. So scorecards highlight tension. The next reason scorecards work is because people have what's called dormant desires, dormant desires, so hidden desires, secret desires, things that they don't even know that they want. So if we were to go and look at the marketplace, we could say that there are two types of customers. There is a customer with dormant desire and there's a customer who's actively searching for something. For example, 
Let's take fitness trainers. Let's say that there are some people who right now are actively looking for a personal trainer. They're looking for a fitness trainer. So much so that in the last 24, 48 hours, they've Google searched fitness trainers near Wimbledon, right? They've just been searching for it and they've been looking for different options. They've been on their Instagram searching for fitness and gyms and all that sort of stuff. That's called an active buyer. Let's imagine that in Wimbledon, there's a small number of people who are actively searching for fitness trainers and gyms and that sort of stuff. Which market do you think is bigger? The active market or the dormant market? The dormant market are people who have got a frustration. They've got a, they would describe that it's less than perfect. They'd say, I'm not perfectly happy with my fitness, but they're not actively looking. That market is massive compared to the active market. So you'd basically say the dormant market is the huge market. Now I'll tell you the secret between businesses that are multi, multi million pound fast growth businesses and businesses that stay small, typically the small businesses go after the active market. So when someone searches for a fitness trainer, they say, I'm a fitness trainer, right? I'm here. I'm better than these other fitness trainers. And they're fishing in that small pool that active, of active people searching. The businesses that are extremely fast growth are the ones that know how to go into the dormant market and wake up the dormant desire. They can actually take a small frustration, articulate it, wrap some numbers around it, put a story around it, and take someone who wasn't really searching into something else. Now think about it like this. When someone is actively looking for a solution, they've got their mind set, they've probably got a budget in mind, and they've got an outcome in mind as to what they're doing for. So for example, if I'm actively searching for CrossFit, I'm going to go and search for CrossFit clubs and I'm going to have a budget in mind of £100 a month. But if I said I'm frustrated that I'm not fit and I'm not spending enough time outdoors or doing fit things, I could end up signing up for yoga, I could send, end up signing up for golf, I could sign up for a personal trainer, I could sign up for any number of gyms. There's a huge range of options that I might sign up if, I'm, if I start with just the dormant desire. So here's the thing, whoever provides the light bulb moment to the person who has a dormant frustration is the person who typically wins the sale. If you're the one who provides a light bulb moment, an insight, you shine the light on the dormant frustration and show a path or a solution, you are the one who activated them from dormant to active and essentially you're, you're way out in front at that point for winning the sale. So. One of the things that scorecards do is they are the light bulb moment that awakens a dormant desire, that it actually wraps a framework around the dormant desire. The next insight is that great brands manufacture demand. Great brands manufacture demand. In the industrial age, people like Henry Ford became the wealthiest people on the planet by manufacturing supply. We have this terminology in the economy called gross domestic produce. Gross domestic produce is back in a time from an era when it was very difficult to produce things. And the default assumption is if you can produce it, we could definitely sell it, right? The hard part's making something, the easy part's selling it. So think back maybe 150 years ago, if you could manufacture scissors, right? You've got a scissor factory, you can make them as fast as you can make them. People are like, oh wow, fantastic, scissors, I'll buy those. That's not the hard part. I'll bu buying them is the easy part. Making them is the hard part. So the scissor factory millionaires were making the scissors. Fast forward to today. You go on Amazon, you do a search for scissors, there's 500 different pairs of scissors. There's different colors, different sizes. There's scissors for the purse, medical scissors, kids play scissors, right? So there's an abundance of supply. So the millionaires today, the people who are super successful today, are the ones who know how to manufacture desire for something. They can manufacture the demand. So it used to be that you had to manufacture the supply. Now you have to manufacture the, the demand. So if we think in the industrial age, the supply side was where they were very clever at tweaking every tiny little efficiency out of the production line. Today, the people who are making great money are tweaking every little efficiency out of the what's called the funnel or the customer buying journey, right? So they're doing the entire customer buying journey. Now, a lot of people are still tweaking their supply side, but they haven't mastered the demand side. So what we need to do is have a production line, a perfect journey that people can go through that actually manufactures the desire, manufactures the demand for something, and then you're the one who's got the answer for that. 
So this is what scorecards do. They're very good at manufacturing demand and they're 24-7, they're always online, they're always available for your customers to do a self-assessment. Final thing is that people love to score and improve, right? We're, we are ridiculous, right? We're like, who's one of those people where it's like you go out for a walk and you realize that the walk was like eight minutes and you're like, tomorrow I'm going to try and see if I do it in seven minutes or like you're always thinking about little ways you can score and improve things. And we know that no one would watch sport if there wasn't a scoreboard. If it was just people kicking the ball around and you took away the goalposts and you took away the scoreboard, no one's going to do that. So people just love this concept of scoring and improving things. And scorecards give people a way to score and improve absolutely everything. So this is the psychological reasons as to why people do this. Now let's talk about how we do it. So in order to have a successful scorecard campaign, we've boiled it down to just four things. You have to have a landing page that communicates what it is people are going to score and why they want to score that thing. A questionnaire, so a set of between 10 and 50 questions typically that people are going to answer. Then a results page that shows them here's how you scored, here's how you end up, here's your ultimate result. And then you've got to have a way of promoting it and get the word out so that more and more people take your scorecard. It's those four things and that's all you have to do to have a successful campaign. Now I'm going to go through a bunch of this and how to quickly do it. 